Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the Salon at Melbourne Recital Centre. My name is Marshall Maguire, I'm the Director of Artistic Planning and it's a pleasure to see you all for this next installation of our Bark Adventure, 48 Ways of Looking at Bark. This is the fifth iteration, that means we've done, we're doing eight Bark Preludes and Fugues each concert, so we'll get up to number 40 tonight. I've got to think about it, but we're in book two now. This is the set that he wrote 20 years after he wrote the first set. And what we've aimed to do this year is invite some guest artists to present their favourite Bach preludes and fugues and couple them with music that means a lot in their lives. So Elizabeth Anderson will be well known to many of you and she has a fascinating take on her connections with Bach. I'd also like to say that at the end of Elizabeth's performance tonight we will have a quick chat here on stage just to tease out a few of her ideas and you're most welcome to stay for that and um, get a little bit beneath her thinking about her life with Bach. So enough from me. Please welcome to the stage for the next iteration of 48 Ways of Looking at Bach, Elizabeth Anderson.
This next piece is by Anton Heiler, an Austrian organist who was one of the earliest um, organists to become interested in performing early music um, in a historically informed way. And my husband, Douglas Lawrence, studied with Anton Heiler in Austria um, back in the 70s. Uh, Heiler was a, a genius of an organist and also a brilliant composer. He wrote this little piece for his wife, who he called Ernie, uh, to celebrate their wedding anniversary and for Christmas. And he was obviously inspired by the B minor fugue from book one, uh, where Bach, uh, in his fugue subject, uses every semitone in the chromatic scale, so a 12 semitone row, a bit like Schoenberg, if you like. Um, as his fugue subject. So, something like that. Uh, Heiler uses Bach's name, B-A-C-H. Now, in German note naming, you have a, a to H rather than just A to G. So, Bach's name could be spelt entirely in letters. B is B flat. A, C, H is B. And Bach uses that little signature, uh, hides it in all sorts of pieces and in many of the preludes and fugues, not necessarily in that order. But this particular pattern appears quite a few times and Heiler uses it in several different keys. Let me just show you how. So he transposes it to here and he transposes it to here but he uses those transpositions all overlapping each other. So the first note, first bar, last note, first bar, first note, second bar, last note, second bar. Meanwhile, second note, first bar, third note, first bar, second note, second bar, third note, second bar, and in the left hand, first note, third note, first note, third note, and second, fourth, second, fourth. So every single note in this piece is part of the spelling of Bach's name. It's brilliant. It makes a scale that's, we'll call it a mode, um, a mode made by Heiler, if you like, that sounds like this. Oh, sorry. A bit like a minor, minor scale. So enjoy Heiler, Heiler's a little over B A C H.
play your cue first. You'll understand the reason when you hear the prelude. <laughs> when I get to the prelude, I'll start on the upper manual. When I'm playing on the upper manual, I need you to help me. And you'll see what it is that I want you to do. But please watch, because as soon as I switch to the lower manual, you'll need to pay attention. I want you to stop clicking as soon as I switch to the lower manual. And then when I switch back to the upper manual at the end, I want you to click again. Just watch me.
Hi. Hello. Thanks thank for you. having me. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you what for inviting me. What a rich treat. Me. Goodness. Thank you. Um, where to begin? Why don't we begin at the very beginning? By the way, ladies and gentlemen, um, we'd love you to stay, but we also understand if you need to go, um, please feel free, but we'll be five, six, seven minutes, depending on how much we tease this out. But again, back to the beginning, was Bach part of your early keyboard explorations as a student? Ah, oh, um, well, I remember hearing Bach for the first time. My mum was a member of the World Record Club. Doesn't it, does it still exist? No, it doesn't, does it? Um, Records yeah, don't mum exist anymore. Had, mum had a set, I think it was something to do with the recorder. It was excerpts from all sorts of wonderful um, recorder solo. And it was the, the one from the Magnificat um, with the alto, male, first time I'd ever heard a male alto singing with two recorders. And that's the first time I'm aware of having enjoyed something by Bach and I, I used to play it over and over again. And then you you didn't start as a musician on the harpsichord, I'm guessing. You probably played I piano, piano first. piano, yeah. And I had, um, I learnt, I was in Launceston. I grew up in Tasmania. And I learnt from Marjorie Allen, who was a very... Uh, very well respected. I was going to say very old, but she was always old. Um, she was a dragon lady and everybody had the utmost respect for her and she was considered to be the best piano teacher in town and everyone was really scared of her and she taught a lot of Bach. I played a lot of Bach preludes and fugues with her. And even back then, it was seemed unusual for a piano teacher to get you to play so many preludes and fugues. One thing... I wanted to talk about today as well. Use the organ. We gave you a choice of any instrument here at the Melbourne Recital Centre, and you chose this magnificent instrument. But also, you played one prelude and fugue on the organ. Yes. Why that one? Well, Bach never travelled outside of Germany, but he was very interested in different styles. And to me, that prelude and fugue is very much in the Italian style. It reminds me very much of a Frescobaldi toccata. Um, of ties and suspensions. And this was a genre. It came to be associated with communion. Um, somehow or other, this, this genre of lots of very long notes tied across bars, then resolving dissonances, something uh, became associated with transubstantiation. Um, kind of a mystical thing. Uh, to me, that is is one of those kinds of toccatas, that prelude that I played on the organ. And, and for me, if you play that on the harpsichord, the long notes go for so long that you can't hear them anymore by the time the suspension resolves, the dissonance goes to a consonance. And also because Bach called it the uh, well-tempered keyboard, not the well-tempered harpsichord um, and so, obviously, he meant these pieces for all keyboard instruments. And because you've got such a fantastic collection do, here, I had to take advantage of being allowed to play more than one. And thank you for making that choice. I noticed with the harpsichord as well, you were doing a bit of coupling and uncoupling there. And for those who aren't familiar with harpsichords and, and different keyboards, what, what's going on there and why? Okay, well, well for me, um, many of the 48 Preludes and Fugues are written for a two keyboard instrument. And it's quite clear to me why that is. When you start playing a fugue and you've got the subject and then in the other hand, the counter subject comes in and the other hand is supposed to play one note exactly the same as the, the right hand. The right hand's supposed to play it for a crotchet and the left hand's supposed to play it for a quaver. Well, you can't do that on one keyboard. You can't hear that there's one quaver and then another one holding for a crotchet. But if you have two keyboards, obviously, that's what it's meant for. So wherever I found, I call it the setup because you nearly always find that within the first couple of bars. And so if the setup contains this crossed hands um, kind of um, figure, then obviously that particular um, piece is meant for two keyboards. And so that's why I divided my hands on some of those or of course, he never devised these books of works to be played as we're doing them here. It was never meant to be presented in sort of chronological order, if you like. So you would have selected, if you're on a single manual harpsichord, you may have selected pieces that were suitable for that 
really play it on whatever you like. I've even yeah. played them on harp. Don't tell anybody. No, of course you can play Bach on anything. <laughs> One thing also, you're renowned for bringing Bach or the style or some of the themes of Bach into the crashing into the 21st and 20th centuries. Alec Templeton, Willard Palmer, obviously inspired by Bach to their very yes. core. Tell us about yeah. these two. Um, Alec Templeton was the son of a piano teacher in Wales. He was blind from birth and he played by ear. He played jazz on the piano and he also played harpsichord. He went to the USA and lived in New York, I think, and became quite famous as the musician, the main musician on a talk variety show. Uh, and he wrote that um, possibly for the harpsichord because he is known to have played the harpsichord and he was a great follower of Bach and uh, played many of the Preludes and Fugues, of course, and he wrote as a little subtitle to that one, uh, Prelude and Fugue in Swing, as Bach would have written it were he alive today. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and what about Willard Palmer? What's, what's his story? Um, um, Willard Palmer's an story. American music educator and I just found that it's a prelude and fugue but you have to play them the other way around because the prelude's so good. Um, but I found that in a collection for students with um, just a number of different modern genres. I think it's in the Alfred um, series. And that's just a gem. There are a few gems in it, actually. Um, and mostly written by Willard Palmer. So it, that was his idea of introducing young students to preludes and fugues and explaining to them what, what they are. And of course, as much as we love audience participation here at Melbourne Recital Centre, we feel that perhaps we need to do a little bit more of that because while the clicking of the fingers was good um <laughs> we, we could have done it better we, couldn't we, we? Do, but we'll have to get you back to do more willard palmer thank more you. finger clicking <laughs> i would love Elizabeth to come Anderson, thank you so much for joining us tonight Thanks, thank you everybody we'll see you next time thank you.